Hello there, my name is Phil Williams and I would like to welcome you to Audio Angling, the podcast site of fishingfilmsandfacts.co.uk. In part one of this interview with British Record Fish Committee Chairman Mike Healing, we discuss the more general overarching issues faced by the committee in its quest for modernisation since coming under the wing of the Angling Trust. But because that part of the debate here took more time than had been initially envisaged, it was decided to break at that point and return in part two to discuss the specifics of the four subsection headings under which record fish are collated, these being sea, game, course and mini species, taking them in that order and starting with the sea species list. When I first became interested in fish recording, all marine species were lumped into the one list with the biggest example, whether it be boat or shore, holding the record for that species. Split list showing boat and shore came ironically when, after much seemingly wasted campaigning, myself and the late Bob Gladhill started drumming up support to set up a split list independent of the British Record Fish Committee. Now, in 2013, with sea angling attitudes and the fishing itself having changed so much, maybe it's time to look at further potential areas of change, starting with the sea fish list. What then are your thoughts on splitting the boat records under the subheadings of charter and trail boats? I personally feel that some recognition for record fish should also go to charter skippers who at the end of the day put the captor over the fish. Their names should also be included in the list. And what about another list for marine species caught on the fly? I think that then becomes more a list of fishing attainment by method or type than a r- actual list of record fish. I'm sure it would be of interest to some anglers to have those r- lists split like that, but the record fish list is about recording the maximum size of the species available to anglers or found around our coasts of the British Isles. It's not a mark of angling skill or prowess it's about recording the fish so the committee has always avoided getting too deep into how fish are caught the only requirement is they're caught on rod and line we had a fish yesterday that was um, a spanish mackerel potentially submitted but caught on a hand line being trolled behind a boat well the committee requires they're caught on rod and line not on hand lines so that was excluded immediately Interestingly enough, there's been about five claims this week for Spanish mackerel. They're obviously coming into the southwest in huge numbers at the moment. But, as I say, this is about recording the fish. And I know anglers think getting the record is a mark of their prowess, but the committee don't see it like that. The committee sees its function as recording the species and size they attain. It's not a mark of angling skill or prowess. I think there are good cases for having awards particularly for boat skippers most of my sea fishing was was on charter boats we booked our skippers very carefully almost as carefully as we booked our tides to make sure we got the best we could find in a particular pool at some time in the future i would love to see there to be awards for charter skippers because they make a huge contribution to the enjoyment for hundreds of thousands of anglers every year and their skills should be recognized In time, I'd like to think the Angling Trust will be funded sufficiently to do things like that. But at the moment, with it still growing, it's not in a position to take those new roles on without the funding being available. We've started to recruit some charter skippers into membership and become quite active in some of the campaigns to represent their interests. So I'm hoping that's a sector that will grow for the Trust in years to come. And maybe then the Trust can look at introducing those sort of awards. But awards for fishing skill i think rely and depend totally on the angling trust whereas the the record of the fish is in the remit of the committee and nothing beyond the record of the fish is in the remit of the committee really what value is there in having record qualifying weights when a new species enters the list from say the boat it automatically generates a vacant slot in the shore category and vice versa which on the face of things is fine but why then does the vacant slot need to be given a qualifying weight I mean, what realistic chance have shore anglers got of catching, say, a mako shark of £40, or better still, any tunny, never mind a £40-pounder, when none have been caught in the UK since the mid-1950s? Surely, one of any size of both those species would be a creditable achievement. 
Well, principally, I mean, the committee is run by a bunch of volunteers, with the exception of Nick, who does the secretarial work. The qualifying way is to stop people claiming fish that are of a common size and getting hundreds of claims in a relatively short period. The fastest claim I've ever known took eight days from capture to the committee agreeing it as a record. Some records take a huge amount of background research before we can say yes to them. And if we were subjected to hundreds of claims below what we've listed as qualifying weights, which we've listed weights where we think they are reasonable weights which are attainable and would be a significant fish that should be recorded, that limits the amount of work that we ask a load of volunteers to do in their own spare time, which is basically time when they could be fishing, but they're contributing it back to the sport. So the qualifying way is to effectively not get loads of claims submitted for fish that could be a record size for five minutes, but are not significant in terms of the historic record or the scientific record. The first Mako shark in 37 years was caught in the UK earlier this summer, and no tunny has ever been caught here since the 1950s. So do you really believe any qualifying weight for those two species and the other shark species are required to cut down on increasing workload for the committee? I don't, mean it may not, but I can't really answer for the decisions made some time ago on what the qualifying weight should be, but even, even if the committee was to now look at those qualifying weights, and in time it will do as part of the overall review we're conducting, there will still be qualifying weights, even if they're reduced somewhat. When we introduced the the DNA list on coarse fish, we established qualifying weights at around the weight of the existing record. And actually, we've seen, as a consequence, a number of claims made using DNA analysis, which has which is actually proved the fish not to be the species claim, or not pure species. And at the last meeting, we had quite a lengthy conversation and discussion about where should we be pitching the qualifying weights for those? And I think that will lead us into the conversation about qualifying weights on sea fish as well, that you know we are reviewing all of this, but we devote a day every six months to the committee work, and we try and do the main work of the committee is approving records, which we do electronically outside the committee as far as we're able, so that we can spend as much of our time together discussing just these issues and trying to reach conclusions that can move the whole thing forward. That's quite time consuming, but I do think all of these decisions, quite often there's a body of opinion that is in favour of change, Quite often there's another body of opinion that is in favour of keeping it where it is. So you have to reach these consensus positions and that can take time. But as I said to you, I think when we first started this interview, some of the questions you've raised have been really useful in highlighting areas that we need to be looking at, which frankly I would have probably overlooked because I'm more concerned with the current stuff we're dealing with than the historic stuff that we've already dealt with or has been dealt with in the past. But, I mean, the question is a valid question. I'm not saying it won't happen. What I'm really saying is we are reviewing things, and as a result of the question, I think we're likely to look at that. I don't think we'll scrap qualifying weights, but they may well be reduced for those species where we're not seeing claims at the moment. But if, as you yourself said earlier, the committee's job is not to record angling prowess, but simply to chart the best fish ever taken on rod and line, then you're not doing that by excluding fish, which, while they may be small from the shore by comparison to what the boats can achieve, are still, nonetheless, the best examples possible, and therefore are genuine records. I would agree with you entirely on that, but I would agree with you as an individual. And that's part of the problem. I can answer these questions for me very easily. And I think you and I would be probably rowing in the same boat, in the same direction. When I answer for the committee, I have to try and reflect the committee's views, because in this situation, I'm the representative and the mouthpiece of the committee, not Mike Healing as an individual. So, yes, I, I mean, I agree with you absolutely that there are lots of things that the committee needs to do. And as chairman, I'm hoping that before I pass to other places we will have got a lot of that done, if not all of it. And partly that will be about 
us and me going out, meeting the community and seeing what the community of anglers wants from the BRFC and trying to deliver it so that it becomes more meaningful to anglers in the future again. Qualifying weights also generate one further problem. Something I hope to look at specifically a little later on is the mini species list. These are fish without boat or shore status which fail to reach a pound in weight. Rightly or wrongly, that is what denotes them as being mini species. So how do you explain a qualifying weight of 12 ounces for the vacant comber shore record slot? The boat record at the current time stands at pound thirteen ounces, so obviously the vacant slot has to be set lower than this. I personally would have set it at a pound, or better still, as with all vacant slots, leave it open to claims without any qualifying weight at all. But setting it at 12 ounces makes a mock of your own mini species rule. Yeah, actually what we're doing is we're reviewing the whole status of the mini list. As a result of you asking me the question, I went to the committee and said, why have we got a mini list? <laughs> and why is it weighed in drams, or, or in grams and not in ounces and drams? And there were all these convoluted reasons as to why the committee had made that decision. But again, asking the question raised the prospect of, well, then we should review it and plan for the future and not just be dependent on what's gone on in the past. So that's part of what we're looking at the moment. And we're looking at the implications. I mean, one of the other questions that that raises is we're now dealing with a community of young anglers for whom pounds and ounces are absolutely meaningless. And that's another decision we have to take. And I think what we will do is we will maintain those weights that are measured in pounds and ounces in pounds and ounces, but we will have to have a comparison chart. And as more and more fish get weighed in kilos, then they will be recorded at the kilo weight that they're weighed at. Because what we're always looking to do, and we had a huge discussion two years ago about the conversion factors that were used because people had been converting weights backwards and forwards between imperial scales and metric scales where both sorts had been used to weigh the fish. And if you don't get the conversion absolutely right, you can actually increase the recorded weight of the fish. And we also did a whole review of what weight can you accept a fish with when it's weighed on a scale that only gives you, say, a two ounce margin, you know, weighs one pound, two ounces, one pound, four ounces, and so on and so on. And we had a huge issue with that. And that took us, I bet we worked on that for the best part of two and a half years to get to an agreed solution that actually worked properly to record the fish at the weight it had been caught at and the weight it could have been measured at. Because obviously, you might claim a fish at, say, £7.13, but if you're weighing it on scales that measure only in two-ounce segments, you can actually only claim that fish at £7.12, because you can't measure £7.13 on those scales. You could estimate it, but you can't weigh it at that. And you can't replicate that test when you test the scales. I guess we spent six or seven meetings mostly discussing the weights and how they should be recorded and the science behind conversions and how many decimal points did we need to go to to ensure we were recording weights as accurately as we could. Fortunately, there's some really good people on the committee who understand these things and have got that sort of detailed mind. I think we're now at a place where we can move forward on weights, securing the knowledge that what we actually record will be as close as it can be to the truth. We're looking now at, do we record in metric or imperial, and how that all will work in future. And I think, I mean, we are looking at the mini list and thinking about putting it into the main list and showing more data in the list itself so that you don't need the two lists. An even more troubling inclusion or exclusion problem is the sandy ray Raya circularis, which has never been caught officially on modern line and yet is listed with two vacant record slots both for the boat and for the shore. Why not, then, every other species of fish that's never been caught on rotten line? I can't give you a sensible answer to that. All I can say is I will raise that with the committee. It's an issue that predates me, and I'm not qualified to answer the question I don't know about. I don't know what the committee had in its mind when their decision was taken, and I, frankly, if it's never been caught on rotten line, I wonder why it's on the list as well. It seems mad to me. 
but I will check it out. I'll go back to David Rowe, because he's the most likely person to know of the current members what happened with that fish. It's another thing we need to look at. It's one of the reasons, I mean, I keep coming back to this. This whole process of this interview has been so useful in terms of pointing me in the direction of stuff that I wouldn't have ever picked up on the sandy rays and caught on rod and life in a million years, frankly. I don't think I've ever seen a sandy ray because they're just not around bits of coast that I fish on. So, Off the top of my head, I think it's a deep water species found mainly at northerly latitudes. Yeah, with climate change, they'll probably move further away from there as well in time. I mean, that's one of the other things we're having to look at increasingly is in our considerations of what the committee does and where it moves to in the future, is what impacts will climate change have on record keeping in terms of new species and the weights that fish are likely to attain. And I think we will want to start recording, particularly with sea species, we'll probably want to start looking at, maybe not regional records, but at least keeping some record of how fish are moving around our coasts because I think that's going to be valuable to the scientists in terms of climate change impacts. Now can we look at examples of potential wrongful inclusion? Apart from the sunfish, which some marine scientists regard as being impossible to catch fairly on modern line, there are two other species of fish whose record status is in much more doubt. Let's start with the smooth hound. After undertaking an extensive investigation into smoothhound speciation for his PhD thesis, Irish research scientist Dr. Ed Farrell failed to find even a single specimen of the so-called common smoothhound Mustellus mustellus in either UK or Irish waters, and nor could he find any in historical museum collections. On the basis of DNA studies, every one, including those without spots, was identified as what you list as the starry smoothhound, but according to Dr. Farrell, Mustellus mustellus categorically does not occur at our latitude. Currently, the Irish Record Fish Committee list only the one species. The Welsh, I understand, are also looking to do the same, and with only Mustellus asterius currently recorded north of the border, the Scots don't yet have that problem. That said, the committee's expert, Oliver Crimmon, at the National History Museum, obviously thinks otherwise. <laughs> Uh, I raised this at the last meeting, and Oliver is absolutely convinced that he has in his collection the common smoothhound taken from the North Sea. He said he would go back and review his collection and, if necessarily, get some DNA analysis. But the reality is that, yes, Ed did the work, and I'm not knocking Ed's work. He does a huge amount of really important work, for, particularly for sea fisheries. His adjudicator on his doctorate may well have agreed that the work had been done to a sufficient standard to award a PhD and was of value, but I don't think the paper has been peer-reviewed. And a thesis doesn't change accepted science and without it being peer-reviewed and without other people checking their own samples that's going on at the moment in terms of the Natural History Museum and it may well be that as a consequence of Ed's paper and the work we've now instituted on the back of that, I have to say this was done before you raised the question because I saw Ed's paper I think when it was first published two or three years ago it came to my attention and I've been asking the question ever since that are we sure there are actually two smooth hounds? I mean I used to catch a lot of smooth hounds and for me, and I guess for most anglers, a starry smoothhound has got spots and a common smoothhound doesn't have spots, but I know that's wrong. Since coming onto the committee, I've learned quite a lot about the science of identifying some species. But as I say, that is being reviewed at the moment by the Natural History Museum, and, and as a consequence, it will be reviewed by the committee when the museum comes back with a firm answer. The other wrongful inclusion problem you need to face up to, and to be fair, so too do the Irish, as the fishing question was caught in Belfast Lock, is the anglerfish. As far back as 1974, this committee's own fish identification expert, Alwyn Wheeler, produced a paper highlighting the existence of a second almost identical species of anglerfish found in northern European waters. Again, historical museum collections bore this out. So which species is it that currently holds a British record? I can't tell you. I do know that if Wynne identified the species, 
it was that species, because Wynn was, I mean, frankly, he was awesome in the job he did. I think I mentioned to you earlier, we've got exactly the same problem with the skate record. There were two records for two subspecies, and then the scientists changed the classification into one species. Recently, there's been moves in the scientific community to go back to the two subspecies, and I'd need to check out whether the anglerfish is in the same category as that, as having been at some stage reclassified, and therefore the record has changed. But I can't tell you which species the record is, other than when I identified the bocal fish, and I assume that's the correct identification for it. It certainly isn't a subspecies issue. The second species, Lophius bodigasa, had always been known about but I don't think anybody realised they occurred as far north as the British Isles. Ah, it could well be. Then Wheeler produced a paper on it. The question then has to be, will people start looking at future caches to see if we need a second anglerfish slot? I think it's likely to remain an issue held in abeyance for quite a while. The way this works, I mean, we tend to think of having scientists at the Natural History Museum who are buried in their collections and are working a wee beaver in a way in the depths of the building all year on fish. The reality is that I think both Alwyn and certainly Oliver probably spend much more than half the year not in the United Kingdom. They're working at an international level all over the world, advising local fisheries services and local national collections on fish science and you know, how to do the job as well as how to identify fish species. And these are internationally acclaimed scientists really who are pretty much unrecognised because they deal with fish. But these are guys who literally travel the world and at the moment Oliver's on holiday but I know when he comes back from holiday he's off to the far east again on a long secondment to work on some species over there. And these classifications change as scientists change and as scientists learn more. If you go into the plant world, I mean, 30 years ago, I knew the name of, or the Latin name for most of the plants in the garden. But in the last 30 years, nearly all the classifications have changed and plants that I still think of as being in the same family are now shown through DNA analysis to be not related at all and have been reclassified as a consequence. So this is an ongoing problem and I think it's something I don't know in the past whether the committee has been sufficiently aware of the changes of classification within the scientific community and has moved quickly enough to reflect them. And I want to try in the future to make sure that we put a mechanism in place to keep abreast of reclassifications and to look at how that impacts on the fish we've got listed in particular species. Again, it comes back to this question. Anglers don't want to keep the fish, but if if you give a record to a fish where you've got the body and it forms part of the national collection, you can always go back to that specimen and take a DNA sample and test it and be absolutely certain of what the truth is today according to today's science. Although I'm not mad keen to keep fish, that's the value of keeping samples of record fish caught in the museum because they are there forever for scientists to go back and double check on what went on and what it was. I've just got back from Scotland where I was fishing with James Thorburn who for his PhD was collecting DNA samples from taupe populations to see if they were isolated or part of one big taupe community. To do this he was collecting fin clips. Would it then be unreasonable to have anglers take fin clips, scales or whatever else is required for positive DNA-based identification? Ah, uh, well, haha, we had that conversation, let me think, about four years ago, principally about coarse fish, I have to say. For me, taking a fin clip or taking a scale sample is the easiest thing in the world to do, and if I had a record fish on the boat, I would certainly consider doing it if I was going to consider making a claim. However, there are lots of anglers who have a real issue with either taking a sample scale or with taking a fin clip from a fish. We discussed on the committee making a DNA sample mandatory to enable the claim. In fairness, I think Oliver was okay with that as a scientist regarding sea species. The Environment Agency was much more reticent 
in encouraging people to what they considered mess with fish in terms of taking DNA samples. We finally persuaded them that the value of a scale sample for DNA analysis was okay on the basis that fish lose scales all the time and they get replaced. So a DNA analysis through scale is okay. Fin clipping was a totally different situation with freshwater fish and raised some severe, I mean, serious ethical questions were raised in the committee as to whether we should be encouraging that. Again, personally, I don't see it as an issue, but I do understand that a lot of people do. And as long as a lot of people do see it as an ethical issue, then the committee needs to respect their opinions if we're to continue working together. And again, this, this is one of those really, it's a really, it's a simple question to ask. It's a really, really difficult question to resolve to everybody's satisfaction and knowing that you've got a sample from the fish that is photographed rather than a sample supplied from a fish that would be known to be a true specimen of that species. But there is also an additional safeguard in providing a scale because this could be read and used as circumstantial additional evidence as to whether or not a fish of that age could have attained the weight being claimed. That can all be done, there's no doubt. But the, the real question for the committee was the ethics of what some people called physical dismemberment of the fish, which in my view is a bit extreme, but given the situation of angling and the animal rights movement, a lot of people are seriously scared and worried that if we were to encourage anglers to start taking clippings of fish to claim a record, it would do angling itself a lot of damage. It may well enhance the records and prove them, but potentially it could do a lot of damage to angling. And I've sort of got mixed views about that. I can see where people are coming from. My view is that whatever we do is going to be wrong in the eyes of the animal rights movement, and we should just get on and do what we think is the right thing. But as long as the committee can't reach a position of agreement, then it's unlikely to move. But it's these are questions that honestly... If you came and sat in a committee meeting, you'd be amazed at how long we spend discussing the philosophy behind what we're doing and how it should be done. There are some of us who have very strong views on the need for DNA analysis in the future because it's so accurate. We've had fish rejected in the freshwater list because they show across four or five generations back and are not pure fish. So DNA enables us, and DNA over a period of years will clean up the record list very dramatically where it's applied. It may well be, I mean, we have considered having a separate DNA list from the existing list. And I think as we get more fish submitted with DNA samples, that becomes an easier prospect to consider. So you'd have two lists, one where there may well be a question mark over the species and one where you would know that the species listed according to their DNA is as accurate as it's scientifically possible to be at the time. But they're the sort of questions we're considering and these questions, none of these conversations take place speedily because the people we've got serving on the committee are considered people. They listen to the conversation. They may well have an opinion, but we listen to the conversation. We listen to other people's views, and then we go away and reconsider our own position so that we are seeking to move forward, but that necessarily, because a lot of these are very deep questions, that needs a lot of deep thought about, well, I've heard that now, that changes my opinion of that. How do I now feel about this? And can we move forward? So it's not that the committee goes, oh yeah, well, we'll discuss DNA. Oh, it's a bit technical, isn't it? No, too, no, no, it's too much. We're not going to do that. The committee spends a lot of time both talking about it amongst themselves, talking about it in smaller groups outside the committee and trying to gain experience and gain knowledge and then coming back together again to reconsider it. And every time we reconsider something, there are new arguments put on the table and new facts put on the table that need to be considered. So 
I know people think this committee should make decisions really speedily, but our view is now when we reach a decision, it should have been sufficiently well considered for us to be firm that the decision we've reached is right for the future and is building towards the future and not simply reacting to popular demand. It's, it's a difficult situation for the members of the committee to be in, but that's how we see the work we do as being... If we don't think it's that important that we take a lot of time to consider change and make sure the changes we make are correct, we won't be doing our duty to the angling community or to the record list. And we look back at the history of the record list knowing there have been major changes made in the past, lots of headlines have been created, a lot of unhappy anglers have been created, and some of those decisions I think most of us would go didn't seem very sensible at the time and it still doesn't look very sensible. So we're trying to make sure that the committee moving forward is a group of people capable of taking considered decisions and not reacting to here today, gone tomorrow sort of press stories really. Moving on now to freshwater, course fishing doesn't have to negotiate the same range of obstacles in keeping fish alive for species verification and weighing on firm ground that sea angling has. But still, in record claims terms, it's certainly not without its problems. One obvious difference is the fact that the smaller so-called insignificant species are not hived off into a separate mini-species list. Well, I said we're, we're reviewing the sea list anyway as to whether we should have a... I mean, personally, I don't think we should have a mini-list. I think the mini-list on sea list was originally put together because basically they're all fish that are caught very close to shore. Well, that was one of the arguments put to me. And they're all very small fish. Uh, yeah, right, well, I didn't actually agree with that. As a course angler, we've never had a separate list. If they swim in fresh water, that's the way they're recorded. And in part, that's the thinking, I'm trying to push through the sea list. If they swim in, in salt water, then they're on the sea list, regardless of how big or small they might be. Insignificant species isn't a word I would use either, because certainly in freshwater terms... I know anglers who go out there to catch a record bullhead. Now that might seem strange, but I did witness a bullhead three years ago, I think it was three years ago, that would have beaten the British record. Unfortunately, the two anglers that had it hadn't taken it on rod and line. It had come out of a crayfish trap. But seeing a bullhead of record proportions just makes you realise how big bullhead can grow and what an impressive little thing they are. It happens to be in a local water to me, but I don't have a ticket for it, otherwise I'd be fishing for it. But, you know, these small fish are small, but they're not insignificant in the eyes of the anglers who are catching them, or are they insignificant in terms of the biodiversity of the water they're swimming in? In freshwater terms, the small species are key indicators of the health of that water. And when they disappear, you know something is wrong with the water. I mean, I live in the Cold Valley in Hertfordshire, which is mostly chalk-fed spring waters, and then running out over gravel and clay when it gets down close to London. I've lived here now nearly 60 years, and in those 60 years, I've seen species disappear from my local lakes and rivers like you wouldn't believe. And they would all be what are asked in the question as insignificant species. They're not insignificant, they're really, really important because they're key biological indicators and they're the things that, once we can see them getting re-established, we'll know that all the work we do locally to support our rivers and try and protect them will be starting to pay dividends. So I don't see there's any justification for a, a mini list for sea fish, and I think we should be looking at, we are looking at that, and I think you know, we certainly wouldn't consider introducing a mini list for freshwater fish Partly it's easier with the freshwater fish because there are a lot fewer species swimming in freshwater than there are around the seas. And the sea list will end up being extensive if we go to one complete list. But what other way would you split the list other than size if you needed to split it? I am not convinced or persuaded by any of the arguments I've so far heard that there needs to be a separate mini list for sea species. If they swim in salt water, they should all be on the same list. I can fully understand the value of these fish as bioindicators. I had him a PhD working with sticklebacks and with water quality. Well, yeah, so you'll know exactly how important they are. And that's one of the species I've seen disappear. When I were a lad, 
I can remember seeing three spined and ten spined in the same pool. Now ten spined were pretty rare either in those days. Well, I surveyed 50 watercourses across the entire water quality range and only found them present in two or three. Of the finest quality, I would think. I used to find them in the watercress beds. But even where the water from the crest came out into the general river pattern, I could never find them there. I could only ever find three spined there. I can't remember the last time I saw even a three spined stickle back locally. Three spines can tolerate unbelievably poor water quality, which is why I chose to work with them in the first place. So if they aren't present in a water course, then it's God help anything else. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm talking about here, I'm still talking about chalk fed spring waters that don't support sticklebacks any longer. Now I think, I'm absolutely convinced that that's to do with endocrine disruptors and it's not EDs affecting the fish, but it's EDs affecting the invert structure. Because while I've seen the decline and the disappearance of sticklebacks and minnows, by the way, in the same watercourses, I've also seen a massive decline in the fly life generated each evening. Massive declines. Internationally, there's a lot of work being done on endocrine disruptors, and we're looking at the impacts of them, but we're all looking at the fish, and I'm saying, hang on a minute, don't worry about the fish, look at their food, because if the EDs are affecting the bottom of the food chain, that's where the damage is being done, and that you're only measuring the impacts of the damage through fish, you're not actually measuring the damage itself at a species level which is affected by it. But I mean, talk to any game angler, and they say fly life isn't what it is. Anybody who drives nowadays, when was the last time you had to clean your windscreen from fly spatter in the summer? Doesn't happen. So there are many, many fewer flies in, in our air than there used to be. And I'm convinced that that's the level of science we need to be looking at in the future in terms of the impacts of these chemical breakdown products getting into our water courses and being very long lived. That is one of the, my big drivers in terms of what I do and why I do it. I see the potential destruction of our whole biosphere because of what we're putting into the system without even beginning to understand its impacts. Sorry, that was a sort of a sideways thing, but if we don't understand each other's motivations, you tend not to understand each other, do you? Can I now start to steer the conversation in the direction of the Welsh catfish? <laughs> yeah, go on. Since the 23rd of October 2000, claims for this species are no longer being considered by the committee. I hear on the grapevine that this had something to do with people growing them onto record size before introducing them into their waters in a quest for fishery recognition. Yes, it was. And in all honesty, it continues to be so. The Wells catfish is not a native to British waters. It's an introduced species. It is now established probably in every major river system in, certainly in England, but it has the potential with climate change to have, start to have severe impacts on the biodiversity of our rivers. The reason for the record being suspended, and I, even though I wasn't on the committee in those days, I remember it really well, there was a certain, how can I put this nicely, a certain fish dealer, not a million miles from Essex, who was bringing in regular supplies of catfish that couldn't speak any English. They could only speak foreign languages. And um, I don't think he was actually growing them on. I think they were probably being stolen out of still waters and rivers right across Europe. I'd seen catfish, Wells catfish, landed on the Danube in Hungary in the 1970s by commercial boats from nets at over 600 pounds. I mean, they grow to huge proportions. The fish that anglers are catching are small compared to the capacity these fish have to grow to. The Environment Agency, understandably with catfish, was very concerned with the potential for them to spread and do significant damage to our native stocks, even back at the turn of the century. And the record was suspended because there was no way the committee could ever be certain that a claim for a Wells catfish was for a fish that had been grown on, at least had grown up in this country, whether it was born in this country or not. We also wanted and increasingly want to be seen as a committee that stands for what is best for British fisheries rather than what is best for British anglers. Anglers may well want to catch 
Whales cat fish and they may well want to catch sturgeon. Doesn't mean they should be able to catch them in this country. We want to make sure that British fish and British species and the biodiversity that surrounds them is preserved for future generations and we don't reach the point of having one worldwide generic fishery where Danubian stingray and Siamese catfish can be caught in Woburn Park Lakes, for example. It would be a disaster in our opinion. And working with both the Natural History Museum and the Environment Agency, we feel that not only a moral obligation, but a social obligation to ensure that we accept records for fish which should be in British waters and that increasingly we will not accept records for fish that shouldn't be there. There's a big question mark over the Xander, for example, because the Xander was officially introduced. It's not an illegal introduction. There may have been illegal introductions into other waterways, but I think the Xander's mostly spread through natural connections. There are lots of species that people want to bring in which would, in the event of serious climate change, potentially have huge impacts on our native species and make it much harder for those species to survive those impacts of climate change. Why would we want to stress those species for the sake of having other species imported? If the native species at one stage die out, we can then look at species that we need to import to provide angling opportunities or to provide a new biosphere. But the good thing about freshwater fish is generally they find it quite hard to swim the channel unless there's a person involved in helping them. If there's a person involved in helping them and they're illegal, then they shouldn't be subject to a claim. I take your point with regard to non-native species, but isn't this the same as growing on, say, big rainbow trout in hatcheries to be introduced on press day when they're caught and claimed within hours of release? These two are non-native fish, and on the subject of imported stock and growing big fish on for records, does this not also have implications for some carp? Yeah, yes it does. And the committee has been discussing exactly those problems and you can imagine the size of both the ethical and scientific problem you confront when you're dealing with fish. I mean, carp, for example, are probably the most sought-after coarse fish in the country, either by carp specialists or match anglers on commercial pools. They drive the tackle industry. They've probably been the saviour of angling as a sport in that the rivers probably could no longer sustain the pressure they were under only 30 or 40 years ago before the advent of commercial fisheries. But yeah, there's a huge question about all these non-native species or traditionally not British species and their impacts of climate change. I mean, with carp, my concern has always been carp are now, again, like catfish in nearly all our rivers. River carp are very challenging fish to catch. They're exciting fish to catch because they're not named. They're wild fish, as opposed to the fish that are, are in fishing lakes. If climate change, as predicted, happens and the average temperature rises by three or four degrees, carp will start to breed very successfully in Britain. And having spoken to the guys doing the research on the Murray Basin carp in Australia and the damage they do, the carp we've now got in our rivers could end up eating our rivers and eating the banks out and everything else that goes simply because of their breeding success. And that is a huge issue that we need to be addressing. Thankfully, it's not a question that the, the Record Fish Committee can answer on its own. It's a question that the scientific and angling community has to answer. But before it can answer it, we have to start to consider it. The problem is, because so many people are so mad about catching carp, you try having a sensible conversation with most carp anglers about whether that fish should be in this country or not. And if you decide it shouldn't be, given the numbers we've got, how do you then manage it? But scientifically and biologically for the future, I think this is a huge, huge problem. And I'm not saying I don't like carp, I love carp. I think there's some beautiful carp about whether in the long term they will be seen as a good thing or a bad thing is very dependent on how cleverly we manage those stocks and control them. And unfortunately, 
Course anglers are not very good at getting and understanding the problems some of these fish could cause in a slightly different future from the one we presently live in. But I do, I see them as a huge issue and the sport and the industry and the science that backs it will face huge questions in the future. And I guess in 150 years time, somebody will go, well, why didn't they do something at the beginning of the 21st century? But you can only deal with the way the world is today. And you can, you have to work from what you know, not from what you fear might happen. You might plan for what you fear might happen, but you won't get everybody coming with you until they can see the problems being caused. And generally, by the time that's happening, it's all a bit too late for the rest of the biosphere. In the game fish list, which hopefully we'll take a look at later, a distinction is made between cultivated, resident and wild fish. Yeah, I've had that conversation. But should or could he not also make a similar distinction when it comes to coarse fish? We're already aware that there's one fishery where large carp are introduced and are fed with automated feeders and the owner has said it's his intention to have the British record. Now we're all aware that this is going on and we are all fretful at the time when a claim for a fish from there is submitted because we honestly don't know what we're going to do. Our position as individuals is it wouldn't be a record fish because it's a cultivated fish and it needs to be grown on in the wild. But then you face, because of all these commercial and stocked angling waters, you then face the problem, well, what is a grown-on fish and what is a fish that's cultivated? Where do you put the line now between one and the other? Is it a cultivated fish because it's fed by automated feeding machines on a three times a day basis or something? Or is it a grown-on fish because it's one fish in 20 acres of water where there's 20 anglers all put in 200 kilos of boilies in every year? and there's loads of food available for it. Which one's cultivated? Which one's wild? Is either wild? Is either cultivated? It's a real, real problem. I think we will, I mean, let's say we've had the conversation, we're having the conversation now about the cultivated fish record on the game fish, and our view is to do it, I think we're minded to do away with the cultivated list. Not so much because of the issues we have with the cultivated list in the game list, but because it will introduce problems into the coarse fish list, and we're trying to get consistency of delivery across all three lists, so that it doesn't matter where or what sort of water or what sort of fish an angler is fishing in or for, if he gets a large fish, his claim will be treated in the same way as any other claim. And that's about fairness to the angler as much as about fairness and accuracy in keeping the record proper but it's these are again come back to it the the questions you raised are brilliant in the fact that they spur thought it's interesting that you're raising them at the time when the committee is actively considering a lot of these issues because we are so concerned that we have to lay the foundations now for what will be increasingly difficult decisions for committees in the future, trying to maintain these records. It's part of what I find fascinating about this, because it's a real, it's not, yes, you're dealing with fish, but actually you're dealing with very deep philosophies about how we perceive the world we live in and how we think it might be perceived in years to come and trying to make sure that the solutions we come to satisfy the needs of those philosophies. So where do imported and therefore restricted distribution imports such as American catfish and pumpkin seed fit into the scheme and spirit of what you're trying to promote? They won't, because we will... Well, increasingly, the Import a Live Fish Act is used to exclude... It, it would exclude any American catfish it might not exclude Danubian catfish. The angling community works very closely with the ornamental fish trade and the authorities in determining what fish may or may not be imported. And there are a number of species that may not be imported into this country under 
Ilfa, even for display purposes. Our argument is that if a fish can come in for display purposes, it can move from a pond into a lake and into a river very easily, and often they do. And we are opposed to the importation of new species that have no function in our waters other than to satisfy the needs of pond keepers or people who want to keep fishing tanks. Things like pumpkin seeds, I think, are only in three sites from memory. Our view is, if they're not a native species, we shouldn't have them on the list, and the pumpkin seed is being considered at the moment. And if they're not species that would be reasonably widespread and available to everybody, if they're a localised stock, then they're probably a localised stock because they were introduced and have been sustained locally for some reason. I mean, there's an informed list of native species, and increasingly I think the committee will, over the next few years, be moving to those fish are the ones we record. We don't record the non-natives, because actually we don't want to encourage people to spread them around. And many years ago I was at a NASA conference, a succession of uh, National Association of Specialist Anglers conferences, at which the then catfish group had buckets of kittens by their stand and were saying to people attending the conference, take as many as you like and spread them about. Well, frankly, I have real issues with that. I think it's mindless. A couple of generations ago, it would have been considered sinful to destroy the creation by introducing a species that had no place there. But if that's the mindset you're dealing with in the angling community in terms of managing the spread of species... Anything we can do as a committee to not encourage non-natives to spread, we think is a good thing. It might sound a very pompous view to take, but I work extensively with scientists from government and the industry and have done for a number of years. Non-natives are a major issue going forward and will be increasingly damaging to our environment unless we get some control of them and uh, the committee won't do anything to encourage either the stocking or the spread of non-native fish into our fisheries as a, as a consequence of those thoughts. And presumably other non-breeding species such as the grass carp will also fall into this category. Grass carp fits in exactly the same position, yeah. I mean, when the grass carp was introduced there were high hopes it would control weed in our fisheries. Well, I know some of the weediest fisheries in the country have some massive grass carp in them. But again, yes, they're here to be caught. I don't actually think there's any record of them breeding successfully. So when the existing stocks die out, it's likely we will no longer have grass carp. But again, the grass carp was taken off the list, number one, because it was non-native. But we had very good intelligence that very, very large grass carp were coming in illegally from France and that was part of the trade in illegal carp overall. And the committee doesn't want to do anything that encourages illegal trade in fish because of the damage it creates to our own fisheries. I once did a lengthy interview with John McAngus, who was part of the Great Ouse Riverboard team responsible for introducing Xander to the Fens. John has devoted many years since 1963 to researching and documenting the species, and from his records he notes that no walleye, the American version of the Xander, was ever deliberately released into UK waters. It seems that it was a stray egg in a batch of black bass eggs imported here to establish that species, but subsequently failed, that led to this single catch of a walleye. So as it could never happen again, and as it was a very restricted import, does it still deserve its ongoing status in the record list while others like the wells are barred? I think it will come out of the list. It will be maintained in our records. My long-term plan is that we get the records in an electronic way so that people will be able to research the archive because that to me is actually with the computer. We're not doing our job if we don't get them archived and accessible to the public so people can see. We would need to do the black line on some stuff because people have asked us to maintain security on the actual fishery that fish were caught in so there'd be some work to do on that but only a little bit but I'd be really excited if before I pass on we've been able to get all of the records of the British Record Fish Committee into an electronic database for people to research because 
then it will become a set of documents that's actually useful for more than just a few scientists who have access to, to it. And it will be an interest, I think it will be a fascinating thing for anglers to look through. I'm sure it raised a load more questions, but that's beside the point. I think the walleye, yes, was... There was one very small population of walleye that is certainly died out. Yes, I agree with him. That's certainly where most people that know anything of it think those eggs came from and that fish came from. It's a historic record. There are no walleye in the UK. We sort of leave it on there because we just haven't got around to taking it off, in all honesty. We may take it off. We may simply leave it there as a historic statement that there was once a walleye caught in Britain. It's like on the game list, there was a listing for, I think, a Siberian salmon or a Pacific salmon. It hit the British shores and got caught, but it was actually an escapee from a Russian salmon farm. And increasingly, we're sort of facing these questions. Do you record those fish as part of the list, even though it's unlikely they'll ever be replicated as a capture, and ignore the fact that it was caught in British waters, or do you record it and list it? Because at some stage, someone may come to the record and say, well, why is that? And actually trace back that fish's history to find out where it came from. I can't answer that question because it's, again, it's a, it's sort of deeply philosophical as opposed to being science-based. It's one of the reasons I want the records to be electronic is that you could then take those fish off the record list but you would still have them in the record database and therefore the history of those fish would be accessible to the community. And in part, the list is still reflecting the day when it was a paper list and you didn't have the prospect of putting it into an electronic database for everybody to access all the information. Now the technology is available, I think we've got a lot more flexibility in how we deal with this list long term and what fish are held on the list and what fish records are held off the list but as part of the database are still available for researchers to explore. Finally, an observation regarding two endangered species. Firstly, the skelly, which is actually a salmonid and should therefore not be in the coarse fish list, and secondly, the European eel, which is currently under extreme pressure and could perhaps benefit from its record being close to claims until the situation improves. We've discussed suspending the eel record. I sat with the Environment Agency some years ago when we were first looking at controls on eels and eel fishing in the light of the collapse of the Elva importation of stock into United Kingdom waters, which is a worldwide problem. It's not just the United Kingdom where the eel is under pressure. It's certainly trans-European, and every eel stock across the world appears to be suffering. Had the Environment Agency agreed, as we thought it should, to suspend all commercial exploitation of eel stocks, we would have probably removed the eel from the record list. But the only people who are prevented from catching and keeping eels are anglers. Finally, there's been a reduction in the number of net licenses issued because they're no longer licenses, they're now authorizations. The difference being that where the agency issues or has the power to issue a license, it does not have the power to refuse to issue the license. But where it's an authorization, the agency has the power to issue it at its own decision. So it can say, no, we're not issuing any authorizations or we're going to reduce the number of authorizations. And recent legislation enabled that change. So now there are fewer authorizations for licensed eel nets than there were, but they are still permitted to remove mature eels. Most anglers always fished eels catch and release. Some eels were taken for the table, but relatively few, and it wasn't an issue. Once eel stocks came under pressure, our view was we should represent the interests of the angling community because we are from the angling community, and we maintained the eel as a record and available simply because that was the only way that eels could be recorded to anglers in a time when anglers are no longer allowed to catch them. Even sea anglers are supposed to return every silver eel they catch. But it's only anglers who are restricted from keeping the fish. 
those with a license or an authorization to catch eels are permitted to keep them and they're traded internationally a stock that's under pressure the angling community's view is that we sort of think the name environment agency gives away what it should be doing the first word is the key environment but actually sometimes the agency just doesn't seem to get it there are so many other pressures on the agency to deliver in other ways in part it's become an economic arm of government and they don't want to see the destruction of the commercial eel fishery and let the French get the market. Well, if the French want to destroy their waters, let them. But I'd much rather we were protecting our waters because they're ours and we're responsible for it. So, yeah, we do maintain the eel. If there's restrictions on anybody, it should be on the biggest exploiters of the stock first, not the smallest exploiters of the stock. So the eel, it will stay there. The reality is... Most record eels are never going to run back to the sea. They're eels that, certainly in the Colne Valley, they're taken at the furthest point up the River Colne that eels are known to swim to. Most of the big eels up here come from the lakes around that point, just below Rickmansworth. And it, we've never seen eels in Hemlinstead, for example. They just don't come up the river this far. But historically, they've always stopped at Rickmansworth. Most of the big eels are in those lakes they will stay there and they'll see their days out there. They, they will never run back to sea. And that'll be the same on nearly every river system. You know, we've done a huge amount of work on the distribution of eels. And the big eels tend to be those that are trapped in still waters at the headwaters. Moving on now to the game fish records, though this is only a short list in terms of species, it is nonetheless a group driving more than its fair share of controversy not the least of which is the rearing of various species to record proportions to ensure the records go to where people with money want to fish for them. How can that be right? The simple answer is it's not, it never has been and it won't be. We are looking at this whole thing of cultivated species. It's interesting that when you look at the world record on these species, the world records all come from big lakes as opposed to little commercial fisheries. And I think our records need to reflect the same thing. You get big lake fish growing up because of the wealth of food available to them and the fact that they're not in those incredibly fast streams in the Rockies and other mountain ranges. Things like the Diva Springs fish, which, I mean, Diva Springs was almost set up to capture the record and the money out of lots of wealthy anglers' pockets. or I don't think those fish are worthy of being in the record. The last two meetings we've held, we've, we've had long conversations about what do we do about cultivated species. And the problem is, once these fish have been put into a category in the list, it's very, very hard to turn around and say, we're going to take them out. It's not hard in practical terms, but you've got to make sure that you've thought through all the impacts because you've got to try and go back to where people were when they originally decided they would have a cultivated fish list and understand that decision. Because if you don't understand the decision to establish the list in the first place, it's very hard to make sure you've got the right reasons for taking the list away now. It's interesting, isn't it? This constantly comes back to philosophy rather than fish. It's about not wanting to denigrate what has gone before, but trying to make sure that what goes on in the future is correct for where we are today. Now, I think with game fish, the cultivated list was started at a time when cultivated fish were an issue. They were certainly an issue for traditional game fishers who were fishing rivers and brooks and suddenly were confronted with fish of unimaginable size. But if you also look at the size of the fish being caught in some rivers, and some of the, I won't say some of the best salmon rivers, but some of the most expensive rivers to fish in England, most of the fish in those rivers nowadays are stocked fish. How many years does a fish have to be in the river before it's considered wild? Question mark. Wish I knew, because I don't, and I catch them occasionally when I'm fortunate enough to be invited. But always at the back of my mind is the question, I wonder if this is a wild fish or whether it's a cultivated fish. 
and talking to river fishery managers when the Environment Agency wanted to introduce the restriction on stocking diploid trout and have only triploids stocked, a number of river managers I knew were absolutely certain that stocked fish, diploid or triploid, behaved totally different to native fish of that river. They found different lies, they assembled in different ways, they fed in different ways, they fed at different times of the year, and they would even breed where they were breeding at different times of the year and in different locations. Whether that was scientifically upheld or not, I honestly don't know, but that was the opinion of the people managing those rivers. The laws were then changed so that in time to come only triploids can and will be stocked into our rivers. I sort of have an issue with why are we stocking our rivers with anything? We should be improving our rivers so they actually generate stocks of their own. And if that means that if you want to fish for trout, you only ever fish catch and release, then that's what it means. You catch the fish and you put it back because it's part of the biosphere. Certainly in the States and in Canada, fly fishers very, very seldom take fish for the table. They might take one for breakfast, but they very seldom take fish home. And most fish they catch go back. Increasingly, most of the people I fish with when I'm game fishing in the UK, the thought of taking a fish is the last thing on your mind. You want to catch some things. And I think we, you know, we are reviewing the status of that cultivated list now because it's such a huge question. And also because the coarse fish season has been removed from canals and closed waters so that you know people go coarse fishing 12 months of the year now there is no longer the pressure on the trout fisheries to provide an awesome experience with massive fish so the number of trout fisheries is declined so there's a lot less trout fishing available so the trout fishing that is available is generating better revenues. Therefore, the need for fisheries to do what Diva Springs did is much reduced because people simply want the fishing. And whether it's a four or five pound trout or a 15 or 16 pound trout or a 25 or 26 pound trout is of little consequence to the vast majority of the market. So the economic drivers for those large cultivated fish are very much removed. And that means the committee can now in a different time in a different place sit and contemplate is there a value in having these fish on the record any longer probably not decisions not made that's my opinion it's probably not but i think it's a conversation we're having we will reach a conclusion at some stage and i think we will end up with a saltwater list and a freshwater list And I think there will be no differentiation between cultivated fish and naturally grown fish. It'll be whatever the biggest species was, and we won't actually be interested in whether it was cultivated or not. Simply because the complexity of fish farming and aquaculture is such that in time to come, we won't be able to tell whether a fish is cultivated or naturally grown on. Because I think our stocks are getting so mixed up, it will become increasingly impossible. And it'll only be if a fish comes out of somewhere like Diva Springs that has a particular growing policy and stocking policy for fish that it'll be obvious that that's a cultivated fish. So therefore, why maintain a cultivated list? Go back to what we think are the natural lists and um, we may end up with a list for flowing water and still water. And there's been a lot of discussion about that in freshwater terms, you know, a while back there was a big feeling that I think it was the record chub would only ever come from still waters in future and that wasn't fair to our rivers because there were river species I think right in the middle of that conversation we suddenly had a claim for a record chub from a river which sort of blew people away somewhat so I think we may well end up with a still water record and a flowing water record Then we'll face the question of where do canals sit, because some canals flow and some canals don't. If only there were simple answers to all of these things, life would be so simple. But all of these questions 
raise huge secondary questions in terms of what does this mean long term? And as I say, we are try- I'm, I'm trying to make sure the committee is looking forward 40, 50 years to provide a record base that is meaningful to the community as it may be in, in days to come, as well as to the community today. Reflecting this problem, in the list, a distinction is made between cultivated and wild. Another distinction you make is between sea trout and brown trout, both of which are interchangeable versions of the same species Salmo trutter. Why then do you not make the further distinction between brown trout and ferox trout, which have an equally different life cycle, and which some people say might even qualify for different species status? Ah, uh, well this has been before the committee. <laughs> I mean it is being considered as, as part of the review of the species. Sea trout and brown trout are certainly the same species, but anglers know they've got totally different habits. Brown trout stay in the river and sea trout go to sea and pretend to be little salmon for a little while and get big, fat and very healthy and then come back as bars of silver. I mean, there's an angler who's fished for both browns and sea trout. Yes, I know, I know they're the same species, but they're different fish when you get them on the bank. And ferox, well, ferox trout, I think, frankly, ferox is, yes, it's a brown trout. I think ferox is something that has grown in my understanding in recent years only. I certainly hadn't heard of ferox trout probably until about 12 years ago. As I've read more widely and, and understood more about the habitat of some of those large lakes they're found in, I think, yeah, ferox trout is a big question. I can't answer the question because I th- I would have thought probably the current record brown was a ferox. Yeah, and I, th- and I think that is probably always going to be the case. Again, it comes back to do we have a running water, a lake, and a still water record. There is, unfortunately, another problem here. The ferox in Loch Awe run into the mouth of the river to spawn. So where does the still water become a running water, and vice versa? That's exactly the sort of question that the committee sits and debates when we look at the other options for presenting the list in a different way. Yeah, the ferox will breed on reds just like browns, because that's what they are. Do they throw true? Answer, nobody can tell us. Well, nobody on the committee can tell us, I'll put it that way. Professor Andy Ferguson at Belfast University has done a lot of studies on ferox trout and claims there could even be DNA evidence to separate them as a subspecies or maybe even a species in their own right. They feed differently, start spawning at a much later age and then only once every three years and also are said to breed true. A subspecies. Well, I think that's been interesting about brown trout because certainly when, again, when the agency were looking at the policy over triploid stocking as opposed to diploid stocking their big argument was the depletion of the specific genealogy of river specific brown trout stocks and they were concerned to preserve the integrity of the genealogy of river brown trouts because they were river specific in many cases and it was felt that they were more likely to be able, as a consequence of that genealogy, to resist the changes of climate change. And I think in recent years, part of the angling community has become much more aware that we may be looking at a brown trout from here or a brown trout from there. We could be looking at a roach from this lake or a roach from that lake. And if they are native to the water, and the water has not been stocked very much or at all, then there's quite likely to be significant genetic differences between the same species in different waters. And for the sake of our future biodiversity, we need to maintain those specific genealogical changes and gene bands. And I think that understanding will enable the committee down the line to look at ferox, brown trout and sea trout records in a different light but the committee itself and its advisors 
And I, at the moment, we have two scientific advisors. I would like us to have many more scientific advisors because I think there's a lot of good work being done around the world that we can all learn from. But I think we need a better understanding of all of that science to be able to reach a decision-making process that is meaningful in terms of the record list. It's one of the things I find fascinating is, in my lifetime, we've gone from catching a fish with an adipose fin and spots and saying it's a ground trout, to knowing that we can analyse its DNA, and if our DNA database is sufficient, we can tell you what its parentage is and what river it's come from, and we can also specify that ferox is different from brown trout, even though if I'd caught a ferox even 20 years ago, I would have said, look at the kipe on that big brownie, and wouldn't have thought of it as a ferox. I would have known that it was living pretty much like large perch do. It's become predatory, probably on its own, and has grown big as a consequence, would have been my thinking 20 or 30 years ago, whereas now catch a ferox trout and got a ferox, look at that. And you think of it as a ferox rather than as a brown. So in one man's lifetime, the thinking behind all of this has changed so dramatically on the back of scientific knowledge that we're now facing a different world. And I do think if there has been a failing with BRFC over the years is that it has not been speedy enough at looking at the changes that are going on in the scientific world around it and accommodating those changes within its thinking process. And that's about managing it. In part, it's about it being a group of volunteers rather than a paid-for service, but I don't think, I wouldn't want it ever to be a paid-for service, because I think you need to be able to bring people in with widely diverse experiences and knowledge to work together to try and ensure that this list is meaningful both for the angling community and the scientific community. And speaking of fish with alipores fins, why is it then that the committee treat the skelly, which has an alipores fin, as a coarse fish by including it in that list, while the grayling, which also has an alipores fin and used to be talked about as being a coarse fish species, is included in the game fishing list? Surely all alipores fin freshwater species ought to belong in the same list together. Yeah, well again it comes back to why have we got a game list and a coarse fish list? Why don't we have a freshwater list? Personally, if they were all in a freshwater list, it wouldn't be an issue, would it? But the poor old grayling, I mean, you know, again in the lifetime, when I were a lad, I can remember reading horrendous stories about game fishers in the autumn going down to their rivers and having serious fishings to remove as many grayling as possible. Yeah, what probably one of the most beautiful fish that swims in British waters being slaughtered in huge numbers because they were thought to be damaging the trout or the salmon stocks. I mean, absolute bloody poppycock, but there you go. It was a different time, and I'm, who am I to judge that? I don't know whether the grayling is a game fish or a coarse fish. For me, I'm an angler. It's a grayling, and when I go grayling fishing, I'm really excited to see such abject beauty in my hand when I'm lucky enough to catch some. I think in terms of the list, if we move to a freshwater list, it resolves that issue overnight. And the argument and the philosophy of is the grayling worthy as a game fish or is it only really a coarse fish with a spare fin is an argument for the anglers. And, and they can write and write poetry and novels and books about it till the cows come home. It's a question we will never resolve other than as individuals. For me, it's a fish. It's a fish I enjoy catching. It's a great fish because I can catch it under a trotted float 60 or 80 yards down the stream or likewise and catch it on a dry fly fishing upstream. So for me, it's the perfect fish in any river because I can catch it however I want to fish. <laughs> and therefore, it's a special fish. I don't think in the creation of this place, however it got here, I don't think anything was put into our rivers that didn't need to be there. And it's only man that's put things in that shouldn't be there. If we can preserve what should be and do away with what shouldn't, then we'll have improved our rivers and our lakes. But I guess that's a pipe dream, you know. And finally, for completeness, though we have already touched on this subject, we're left with the mini-species. That collection of second-class citizens which apparently don't qualify to be included with the more deserving proper fish. So why this distinction? 
Why not simply list them in with the rest? Are they not deserving? Some anglers must obviously think they are, otherwise you wouldn't get claims for them in the first place. So will we eventually get to see them in one combined saltwater record list? In one sense I couldn't agree more, they should be in the same list. In another sense I can't agree with you, or the anglers who think it. Small fish can be incredibly challenging to catch, particularly if you want to catch big specimens of those small fish. And we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that quite often a child's first experience of fishing and therefore his entry into this world that is otherwise a mirror of something wet in front of them is catching a fish from under that mirror of minute proportions. If you ask all the anglers in the United Kingdom do they remember their first fish, there's not one of them who won't. They will all remember those fish. Those fish are what generates a nation of anglers, a whole bunch of really knowledgeable scientists working for the betterment of our rivers and our lakes and our fisheries, and conservationists who remain conservationists till the day they die. And I think those mini-species are designed to capture the minds of young people and make them into people who care about this planet. I just, For me, they're really, really important because they are the first fish lots of kids ever see. And you hear the squeals on the beach around rock pools, or you walk along the canal and you see kids catching minnows and sticklebacks and stone loach and stuff. And, and those kids get hooked for life on the importance of those waterways. And it'll be those kids in generations to come that are continuing to protect what we value. Again, as with part one, a long and very detailed no holds barred discussion with a lot of candour on a wide range of topics which I know the committee do feel uncomfortable about, and I'm sure would like in due course to deal with in a way that satisfies anglers, the committee members, and the scientists that support both groups. It isn't going to be easy, but with the right will and an acceptance of the inevitability of some of this, hopefully it will come about sooner rather than later. My thanks then once again to Mike Healing for openly discussing these topics with us here.